capitalism claims to reward the hardest workers with the biggest paycheck. So that must make Wall Street pretty important, right? In 2018, the top 25 hedge fund managers made an average $615 million. They must have done something to earn that, right? It's an interesting question because financial news gets spattered across newspapers and airwaves every single day, but most people can hardly see how the stock market affects their day-to-day -day lives. And it largely doesn't. After all, Wall Street traders aren't driving the buses that take us to work. We don't get a raise when the stock market hits a record high. In fact, most people don't own any stocks at all. A Gallup poll taken in April of 2020 showed that only 55% of Americans reported owning any stocks. But that figure is also misleading because the wealthiest 1% of Americans own 50% of all of the stock value in the country. When you expand that to the top 10%, they own 87% of the value of all stock holdings in this country. The stock market is mostly an obsession of the rich. It's how they turn their piles of cash into larger piles of cash. So it makes sense that a lot of regular people just tune out when they hear about yield spreads or earnings reports. I even saw a tweet once that said the stock market is just astrology for men, which I gotta admit is pretty funny, but let me just say this. Sure, money is a social construct, but it's a social construct that governs every aspect of our lives. Borders are also social constructs, but that doesn't mean people don't get imprisoned or killed for trying to cross them. And what's worse is that financial vocabulary is made intentionally complicated. Really quiescent, or had the view that inflation would be quiescent for quite some time, run correlation matrix around it, all these other things. There are exogenous factors pressing on it. To confuse you and obscure the financial system's real purpose, which is making the rich richer for doing absolutely nothing. The banking industry controls about $20 trillion in assets. The GDP of the United States is just a little over $21 trillion, so it's safe to say that an industry as large as the United States itself is going to have tremendous influence over the political system and the world economy. So in this video, I'm going to be explaining what Wall Street is and why you should be concerned about its increasing dominance. In the most literal sense, Wall Street is a street in the financial district of Lower Manhattan. The two largest stock exchanges in the world, the New York Stock Exchange and the NASDAQ are located on Wall Street, which is why the name Wall Street is synonymous with the stock market and the financial and banking sectors. Like most institutions central to capitalism, Wall Street can trace its origins directly back to slavery. The wall that Wall Street is named after was built to protect Dutch colonizers from the indigenous people that they were stealing land from. This wall was built by slaves. Wall Street was the site of a slave market and speculating on the value of slaves was a huge part of the early financial industry. During Andrew Jackson's administration, huge amounts of land were cleared for the creation of slave plantations. This led to a massive speculative bubble on the value of slaves themselves. The bodies of over 15,000 African slaves are buried underneath the streets of the world's financial capital. Today, economic exploitation continues to be Wall Street's primary function. In a capitalist economy, the private sector is responsible for making goods to meet people's needs. Producing goods requires a lot of money to pay for things like machinery, labor, raw materials, and so on. So private companies have to turn to investors to acquire funding. This is where Wall Street comes in. Wall Street is really just a bunch of rich people who provide money to finance things on the condition that they get a slice of future profits. This is why it's called the financial system. Most of this financing happens on stock exchanges. So what's a stock exchange? Well, like a labor market or a spice market, a stock exchange is a market for stocks. Stocks, sometimes called shares, are certificates that represent one's ownership over a company. Stocks used to be really fancy pieces of paper, but now they only exist electronically. Companies wanting to expand operations attract investment by going public on stock exchanges and issuing stocks, which investors can then buy. The company gets an infusion of cash from selling stocks. And if the company does indeed grow larger and more valuable over time, then the investors own a percentage of this growing company and the value of their certificates of ownership 
their stocks grow in value as well. They can then sell these stocks at a higher price than they bought them for and make a profit. This is how banks and investment firms make all of their money. They buy things cheaply and then sell them after they've grown in value. In other words, they make money simply by owning things. According to the World Bank, $60 trillion worth of stocks were traded on global stock exchanges in 2019. In 2015, investors exchanged $99.7 trillion buying and selling companies. And we're talking about any major corporation you could think of. Apple, Amazon, Bank of America, Walmart, Visa, Disney, Home Depot, you name it and you can probably buy it. There are thousands of transactions like this every minute conducted over computers and in spreadsheets, which move billions of dollars every day. The investor's job is to try to get more money in his spreadsheet than everyone else's. The role investors play in this system of private manufacturing is as decision makers and as gatekeepers. They ultimately decide which sectors of the economy should expand production and which ones should reduce production by choosing which sectors of the economy to invest in. By investing, they also choose which companies will carry out these tasks. Now, in theory, investors motivated by profit will allocate their funds to the industries producing what people demand, because correctly predicting what people want will generate profit. In theory, this creates a system where investors are incentivized to invest their money in the best businesses with the most successful models and practices. In theory, the companies that create the best products will rise to the top, and the ones that create inferior products will fail to attract investment and go out of business. And in theory, this results in a mutually beneficial outcome where the investor makes a profit for investing money in a successful business, and the consumer gets the best product. This is the logical foundation of capitalism's market-based approach to resource allocation, the so-called self-regulating market. But this theory is fundamentally flawed. For production to begin in a capitalist system, companies have to first attract investment. Attracting investment means satisfying the investor's interest, which is generating profit. To turn a profit, Companies have to sell things for more than what they spend to produce them, which leaves companies with two options, either raise prices or lower production costs. This usually involves cutting wages, using lower quality production material, cutting corners on safety regulations, preventing workers from organizing unions, or just outright raising prices while changing little to nothing about the product itself. It's the best iPhone that we have ever created. This is iPhone XS. It is the most advanced iPhone we've ever created. The iPhone 11 Pro, and these are the most powerful and most advanced iPhones that we have ever built. Because investors are the ones with the money to finance production, they have the power to dictate the purpose of production, which they choose to define as enriching investors, which in turn gives them more money to finance production. See how it becomes this sort of circular, self-justifying logic? From 1979 to 2018, Real wages for the median American worker have rose 12%. For the bottom 10th percentile, 4%. The wages of the bottom 5th percentile have actually declined. Meanwhile, the value of the Dow Jones Industrial Average, an in index of the 30 largest publicly traded companies, has increased 656%. But if these companies took some of those profits and used them to give their workers raises, that would mean less money for investors and they would take their money somewhere else. This is why businesses always lobby against minimum wage laws and other regulations that would improve the quality of goods. This is why stock prices go up when companies fire workers. The way corporations have become more and more beholden to the interests of their shareholders has been dubbed shareholder primacy. Shareholder primacy shows the two-tiered nature of our economy. Investors see their money multiply several times over simply because they bought these digital certificates of ownership. Meanwhile, the people who are working jobs, wearing down their bodies for 40 years straight, see a 12% increase in pay over four decades. 
It should be the other way around, because it's the company's workers that make the company valuable. A company like Amazon is valuable because thousands of workers show up to their warehouses and package boxes and ship them. Yet when Amazon stock prices rise, Amazon workers don't see any benefit because they can't afford to buy Amazon stock. In fact, Amazon has an incentive to keep these workers poor because it lowers their operating costs. The capitalist approach to financing production incentivizes companies to act against the interests of consumers and workers, to push every cost on us. Companies are rewarded for making life less affordable. So how can a production model that's based on maximizing profit also meet the needs of society? Well, it doesn't. Just look at the largest publicly traded companies. Tesla, Facebook, Visa. These companies have trillions of dollars in investment while there are people who are homeless. There are people without healthcare. There are people drowning in student debt. Who decided that funding social media and rocket ships were societal priorities? Well, it was the market. A market that invests based on profit potential, not human needs. Of course, the market system will never invest money in free housing or free education because you can't profit off of something that's free. You can't profit off of something that's affordable. Wall Street makes massive profits betting on these companies. But even when they lose a bet, we still pay the costs and they actually make money. In the 2008 financial crisis, banks, mortgage lenders, hedge funds, insurance companies all got swept up in a popular investment at the time subprime mortgage bonds. These people were basically buying a bunch of people's mortgages and collecting the monthly payments. The mortgage lenders liked the mortgage bonds because they could collect big fees every time they issued a mortgage. So they issued a lot of them. Even the people who were bound to default on the loan eventually or didn't even understand the nature of the loan. The mortgage lenders didn't care because the banks immediately bought the loans from them. Do people have any idea what they are buying? I focus on the immigrants, you know? Once they find out they're getting home, they sign where you tell them to sign. Don't ask questions, don't understand the rates. <laughs> like, yeah. idiots. Yeah. And you target immigrants too. <laughs> their, their, their credit actually isn't bad enough for him. The banks took these bad loans, millions of them, and then put them into financial packages called collateralized debt obligations. These collateralized debt obligations were basically just financial assets loaded to the brim with bad loans. Why would anyone want that? Well, with the help of corrupt ratings agencies, these new assets, the CDOs, were rated highly secure AAA assets. Does this make any sense? No. But at the time, CDOs were incredibly profitable, so the banks ignored all the risk. Insurance companies wanted a piece of the action and began selling insurance on these assets called credit default swaps because, hey, they were rated AAA. How could they possibly fail? Well, they did. And in hindsight, they were obviously going to. I mean, the mortgage lenders were tricking teenagers and people with minimum wage jobs that they would be able to afford a mortgage. And the banks never bothered to look because they were too busy making money. By the time the bonds went bad, the bad loans were everywhere. Not just in banks' portfolios, but in other countries and in people's retirement accounts. People lost their homes and their entire life savings because of this short-sighted bet. The whole world was plunged into a recession. Despite ruining an incalculable number of lives, only one banker, yes, one banker, went to jail for crimes related to the 2008 crisis. Did the banks at least have to compensate the public for its money that they just gambled away? Nope, all the way around. The public compensated the banks because the banks convinced the politicians that they were too big to fail. They made us pay for their stupidity. The total bailout of banks, including all of the financial assistance in the years following 2008, comes out to about $16 trillion. Again, it's this circular logic where the banks are too big for us to let them fail, so we have to give them trillions of dollars of our money, which in turn makes them even larger and more intimately connected to the financial system. When the investors were speculating on housing prices, the investors gave no thought to the fact that they were manipulating the value of a very real asset, people's homes. The financial system treats people's most cherished assets and livelihoods as simple opportunities to make money. Another example of this is when George Soros speculated against the value of the Thai currency, the bot, 
and triggered the 1997 Asian financial crisis. Soros makes huge bets on whole countries and economies. Last year, when he saw cracks in the Asia boom, he began selling the currency in Thailand. Traders in Hong Kong followed suit, triggering a financial crisis that plunged much of Asia into a depression. The Prime Minister of, of Malaysia yes. um, said that the region spent 40 years trying to build up its economy, and along comes a moron like Soros okay. with a lot of money, and it's all over. He called you a criminal. It's easier for him to blame an outside force and then to admit that they were mismanaging uh, their economy and their currency. I think that uh, I've been blamed, blamed for everything. I am basically there to, uh, to make money. I cannot and do not look at the social consequences of, of what I do. This isn't to say that George Soros is a particularly bad person and that we need to get rid of the bad investors on Wall Street and get some good investors in there. In fact, like he said, he was just doing exactly what the financial system incentivizes him to do. Invest solely on the basis of profit. That's what all investors do. As far as they're concerned, people going into mortgage debt or people having an unstable currency is just an opportunity to profit. So the problem is that the financial system allows rich people to gamble with such central aspects of our lives, like our housing and our currency. And even if they do lose their bets, the government is sure to bail them out because they're too big to fail, which just reinforces this cycle. In other words, if we make a bad investment, it was our fault, we shouldn't have taken the risk. If they make a bad investment, they face no consequences for their mistakes or greed. In fact, they're rewarded and we pay the price. This probably has to do with the fact that the financial industry is consistently one of the top donors to election campaigns. So no matter who's running in an election, the banks and hedge funds are guaranteed to have an ally in power. This is how executives at Goldman Sachs were allowed to become the secretary of the US Treasury without anyone batting an eye. They're literally regulating themselves. So what should Wall Street look like then? Well, it shouldn't look like anything. It shouldn't exist. The financial system has nothing to do with properly allocating resources or providing average people a way to grow their wealth. The financial system exists to protect the dominance of the financiers. It exists to make the rich richer for doing absolutely nothing. If our goal is actually to build a system that meets human needs, we need a system where all human beings are allowed to participate. Decisions regarding the allocation of money and what kind of goods and services our society should prioritize should be made by the public because these decisions affect all of us. After all, it's the labor of workers that generates corporate profits in the first place. If anything, they're the ones that finance production. They're the ones that make these companies run. The financial industry constantly tries to convince us that they're too big to fail and that our society would be much less prosperous without them. But who actually feels like they've prospered in the last few decades? Nobody. The only ones prospering are the people trying to justify the existence of this parasitic system. Of course the investors and the owners are going to continue to say, you need us. It's in their interest. But for the vast majority of us, I say, let's get rid of this system. What do we have to lose? 